Love, Longing and Death. Stories on Holocaust of Partition. By Amar Jalil. Dedication. To the Children of the Holocaust. I dedicate my book to the children who were conceived to the millions of miserable Hindu, Muslim and Sikh women, dishonored during the savage devastations of 1947, in the wake of the partition of India. They were born the following year in 1948. This year, 2008, they have turned senior citizens in India and Pakistan. Preamble. A Cry in the Wilderness. A boy, about 11 years of age, stood aghast as he watched fire engulf Ratantalao Primary School, Karachi. He had spent the most memorable four years of his childhood from 1942 to 1946 there before moving to the nearby N. J. V. High School along with his friends, most of them Hindus, to complete his secondary ed education. The following year, 1947, turned out to be the most horrifying year in the history of India. More horrifying than the invasions of Mahmud Ghaznavi, Nadir Shah and Ahmed Shah Abdali. The dreadful year was more atrocious than the final phase of the Second World War that had culminated two years earlier, in August 1945, after the Americans had dropped atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Carving out one-fifth of India to create Pakistan, a separate homeland for the Muslims of the subcontinent in 1947 triggered off the most unprecedented savage riots ever witnessed or heard of by the baffled world. Countless Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs, young and old, were butchered. Countless Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh women were abducted, violated and killed. Countless Hindu, Muslim and Sikh children were kidnapped and slaughtered. Property worth billions was destroyed and reduced to ashes. Priceless national heritages and places of worship belonging to Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs were either torched or demolished. God did not intervene to save the places of worship people had erected for his adoration. The ones who lived through the Holocaust, experienced the heat of it, and miraculously emerged alive from the catastrophe, believe to this day that it was a volcanic inferno and hellfire let loose on the earth with utmost fury. It was the price people had to pay for the creation of a separate homeland, Pakistan, for the Indian Muslims. But factually, the Muslims living in India today, outnumber the entire population of Pakistan. Superstitious believe it is owing to the curse of the innocent dead that Pakistan, from its inception, has continually suffered from bad governance, martial laws, dictatorship, corruption, socio-political crises, a dwindling economy, crumbling educational standards, ethnic and sectarian riots, lawlessness, provincialism, fundamentalism, extremism and terrorism and an obvious absence of democracy. Even after 60 years, the rulers have failed to find a viable form of political system to run the affairs of Pakistan. The Muslims at the behest of the All India Muslim League had refused to coexist with Hindus 60 years ago. Since then, ironically the Muslims have not lived in peace amongst themselves, in their specially carved out home, Pakistan. They have killed and ruined each other with utmost impunity over the last six decades, and have retrogressed badly in every field, except warfare. Ratantalao Primary School was not an isolated school in India and Pakistan, and the country newly created for Muslims, that was set on fire. Innumerable educational institutions including colleges and universities were destroyed. Like the 11-year-old boy who stood horrified in front of his school, and saw flames leap out of its windows, several juvenile witnesses to the horrendous scenarios elsewhere have not lived a normal life since then. They have remained psychologically and emotionally perturbed. The 11-year-old boy, who for four years had attended the morning assembly sessions in the school and sung the anthem in chorus, heard its echo mingling with the crackling sound of the burning furniture. Sare Jahan say Asha Hindustan Hamara. Our India is the best in the entire world. He instinctively began reciting the anthem he had sung together with his friends for four years, and walked towards the school as it was being swallowed up in flames. He was promptly prevented by onlookers. The boy helplessly saw his school burn. He raised his arms to the heavens, clenched his fists, and cried, Why, why, why? Why, is more than just a word. It has an entire world of intrinsic values and behavioral patterns. It is imbued with the strength to question. It cultivates courage and infuses an indomitable desire to know. If it settles in the soul it completely alters your life. You begin to realize that there always is an ultimate truth beyond each truth. Why, keeps you absorbed in thinking. You keep pondering on so-called facts that come in conflict with your common sense. You instinctively refuse to accept a truth on its face value that stirs doubts within you. Perturbed, you strive to go beyond the apparent truth and unearth the actual truth. America inflicted war on a weak and a poor state, Afghanistan. It is a truth. It is a fact. But, why, would mighty America, 
situated thousands of miles away, attack a wretched, tiny country and almost demolish it. The, why, would open up several avenues paving the way for you to arrive at a conclusion through reasoning. Several political secrets no longer remain a secret. Why, was India partitioned? Why, was Pakistan created? Why, did the All India Muslim League crave for a separate homeland for the Muslims of India when the two communities, Hindus and Muslims, had lived together for centuries? Why, didn't the Muslims in Spain launch a movement for a separate homeland for the Muslims of Spain when their rule over Spain was longer than their rule over India? Why, as an inquisitive paradigm? It paves the way for you to discover true evidences and reasons behind the formulation of religious, political and historical facts, figures, traditions, customs, taboos, beliefs and faiths that smack of travesty. Without questioning or quarreling with the teachings of the prophets, apostles and great gurus, there are people who break the barrier and undertake an arduous journey in quest of the unknown. It is not a recent craving of man. From ancient times man has engaged himself in the incessant search for the infinite one. The truth. The fact. He doesn't contradict the teachings of the eminent teachers, but inner urge compels him to go beyond what he has learned from his gurus and arrive at his own conclusions. There were times in history when deviation from the revealed guidance resulted in painful death for the seekers of the truth. Some of them gave up their ghosts at the gallows and some languished in confinement for the rest of their lives. However, harsh punishments do not dampen the spirit of the seekers of the truth. They keep journeying into mysterious realms. Incessantly, they remain absorbed in meditations, contemplations and endeavors to understand the ultimate truth. The, why, settled in the soul of the eleven-year-old boy who had seen his school in flames. The elegant school was built in the Anglo-Oriental architectural style with hand-chiseled stone blocks. The next day he returned to his burnt school. The debris was still smoldering. The boy picked up a handful of ashes and rubbed it onto his forehead. With, why, hooked in his heart the boy grew up with visible signs of his inability to merge with the society and the culture he was breathing in. Gradually he became a loner and a stranger. He went to colleges and universities, earned degrees and diplomas, but remained an alien in his own environs. Instead of mingling with people, he withdrew in preferred solitude. He was looked at suspiciously. But he knew he was not descending into the abysmal depths of psychosomatic problems. The, why, had opened up several avenues for him, and he had penetrated the secret chambers of history. He was born an Indian in 1936. Right from his childhood he was imbued with the realization that one's country was one's mother. The anthem he sang in the school settled in his soul, Sare Jahan Se Asha Hindustan Hamara. He was 11 years of age when the self-seeking politicians deprived him of his mother. Suddenly he was orphaned. India was partitioned. Karachi India overnight became Karachi Pakistan. He was told he was no more an Indian. He was a Pakistani. It baffled him. How can politicians alter my nationality? I was born in 1936 when Pakistan was non-existent. It is a truth. I was born an Indian. That too is a truth. No one has right to deprive me of my birthright. It did not take him long to realize that he was an individual, and was of no significance to the two governments the government of Pakistan and the government of India. The two governments had the authority to deprive him of his nationality, and of his mother, India. His refusal to acknowledge the mutual verdict of the two states was of no consequence. His claim that he was a Pakistani of Indian origin was ridiculed in the two states. You are either a Pakistani or an Indian. There is no such thing as Indian Pakistani or Pakistani Indian. But he insisted, and insists to this day that he was born an Indian in 1936. Therefore he is an Indian by birth. This is an irrefutable truth that can't be either eradicated or refuted. But the states do not recognize the personal rights of an individual. Now a senior citizen he is a stranger in his adopted country, Pakistan. In the country of his origin, of his birth, India, he is an outsider. Amar Jalil